Hello, and welcome to our panel designing one-shot RPGs. My name's Haley, and from Story Brewers Roleplaying, and I'll be moderating the panel today. Uh, before we kick off, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are presenting this talk today, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation, as well as the owners of the lands on which our other panelists are present, and to pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. So, one-shots have the hefty task of creating a satisfying and memorable story in just a few hours. And today I am joined by designers B, Logan, Sydney, and Melody as they share their key considerations for creating one-shots and engaging players from the get-go. So from structure to story, we'll be investigating how we can build the most compelling designs for the single session experience. But before we jump into it, I'm going to ask our designers to briefly introduce themselves. And let's just go in a stacked column order here. So um, Melody, if you want to kick us off. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm Melody. Uh, I am a game designer, a writer, historian, researcher. Mostly at the moment, though, I'm an editor. Uh, I do a lot of editing for role-playing games, that sort of thing, uh, when I have time amongst parenting. Uh, I like to write games uh, that deal with historical topics um, and that are a bit weird often. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can read more about me on Twitter at uh, Ono Melody or my website at melodynova.com. V, you want to jump in next? Hello, everyone. My name is V Hendro. Uh, I am one half, the other half of Story Brewers role playing. Uh, we probably most well known for Good Society, but we're also doing a bunch of these small box one shot games, um, which is a lot of the inspiration of my thoughts today, which are the little box games. So uh, you can find my work on storybrewersroleplaying.com. I also do a bit of layout work and graphic design at B Hendro RPG Designs. Logan, you're up next. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hey, everyone. I'm Logan, he, him pronouns, um, and I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri country. Uh, and I'm a game designer and a huge games nerd. I like to make games around self-reflection and connection uh, and a little bit of magic. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter, maybe too much, at ink <sighs> underscore and underscore stories and all of my games at breathingstories.itch.io. And Sydney. G'day, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to be amongst such um, esteemed colleagues. Uh, my name is Sydney Icarus, uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm an RPG designer and descriptivist. My three main uh, focuses are on games with agency, games that provide feedback, and games that offer delight. In terms of one-shot RPGs, um, I have published my own under Waxwing's games, uh, Writer's Last Rights, which is a game about um, palliative care decision-making in a world of giant robots. And I am currently uh, kickstarting along with the Story Brewers, one of their little box games, uh, Decaying Orbit, an artificial intelligence on a doomed space station. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from um, also from uh, Wurundjeri, Wurrung Land, uh, as part of the Kulin Nation, and it's a pleasure to be here. Amazing. All right. So let's get into talking about one-shot games. So the first thing that you have to think about when you're creating a one-shot game is, is this game that I'm thinking of really a one-shot? Uh, so the first question I want to ask is what kind of stories or experiences do we think lend themselves to one-shot games and which ones might need a bit more space to breathe? Sid, do you want to share your thoughts on that first? I would love to. Now, um, do we do the thing where I go, mm, that's such an interesting question and ponder, or do we let the audience know that I've I've been past these questions beforehand? I think I, I keep up the, the mystique. So yeah, what wow. a really interesting question. Um, I think that there's there's two approaches that I like to take with one shot games. Um, first off, in in form, and then in in function. Um, and in fact, reversing those function um, is uh, the way that we engage with our games. And one shot games tend to be designed about filling a space. So it'll be a group between campaigns, or it'll be at a convention, or it'll be um, something that has come up, a player drops out, and we need a game to fill to fill that gap. And so they tend to be about responding rather than about um, executing a plan. Uh, for that reason, I think that games that bring in novelty and a chance to like um, introduce a change are really valuable. So um, games like The Quiet Year, where you play a community sitting around uh, a, a group rather than individual characters, or games like Ten Candles, where there's this novelty of like a dark space and lit candles. Um, uh, Honey Heist, which is like such a tonal change um, to people that are playing D&D &D games. 
Uh, so I think like functionally, you want to do something that's introducing novelty. And then in terms of form, uh, one-shot games by definition um, are about stories that need to resolve on a clock. Uh, they're very constrained. And so I think it's easier to design games that are uncomplicated. Um, when you pitch a game to your table or you pitch a game to people that are going to buy it, you introduce some form of core conflict and that core conflict needs to catch their attention. Things like um, uh, your criminal bears that are going to rob a convention of honey or um, dread. It's like alien, but with a Jenga tower. And so that, that has really core conflict built into it. And then you want to resolve that. Um, you don't want to add twists. So when you ask about games that are maybe not good for one shots, noir and conspiracy thrillers are really great games, but are maybe not as good for a one shot because you need to breathe in that space of the uh, expected and then switch it up so quickly. Um, I think that that for that reason, um, stories that don't lend themselves to D&D, uh, sorry, to lend themselves well functionally, um, are games that are like D&D. &D. Um, anything that's going to be so common and familiar for your audience that they're not going to get that spark, that creative spark of novelty from it. That's an interesting point of view. Uh, Mel, what, what's your answer to that question? Yeah. Um, so this is something I think about a lot um because i like try to when i'm writing a one shot which is most of my games i haven't written like a like a long term uh campaign game yet uh i like i think that it is, is like a purposeful decision it's um you know i want to make a game that fits that that the format uh but like broadly my like pithy and obnoxious answer is you can do pretty much any kind of story uh in a one shot uh which may be controversial too um because i think that the the thing that you're limited in when you're running a one-shot game is you've got a limited amount of time and so you've got a limited amount of game you've got a, like a cap on how many kind of interactions you can have between people between people in the game um between people and you know external things um and so there's only if we're looking at games as like watching a TV show or something. There's only so much uh, screen time. There's only so much you can see on screen. Um, but I, and I think that limits the extent to which you can go granular when you're like making a game. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I think if you're prepared to step back and like take a broader view and let players do quite a lot of the work of like the imaginative work of like filling in gaps between scenes, or um, making decisions uh, that are like maybe a bit abstract, then I think like you've kind of got access to the you know almost the whole scope of narrative possibility there. You could you could just as easily make a one shot game I think about um, you know thousands of years of history, uh, something like dialect for instance, um, with huge gaps in between like scenes in between things happening, uh, as you could make a game that is um, about like a couple of you know like like playing really playing out like a couple of moments in a life or a couple of lives um uh that said you know there is uh like basically you have to be willing to make uh certain kinds of sacrifices of like the actual game mechanics and that kind of thing i think if you want to do something that's like big in scope you can do that you might just need to like gloss over some things take a more abstract approach um but i think if you like set out from the beginning to design a one-shot game um and you have an idea in mind i think there's probably a way to do anything narratively speaking what you're not going to get is the way that um uh you get like evolving character relationships or like really like really like detailed organic like developments over when you return to something over and over and over and over again but you can just players can make that stuff up players are creative they can like they can fill in those gaps without it mm -hmm. um, so yeah it might be more about the uh, amount of detail that's going on in the game and the amount 
of, of uh, that the story needs to evolve rather than um, in itself the subject matter of the story. Yeah, yeah. That that said, I, I like I, I want to say more things on like one shots that are like huge in scope because I think it's <laughs> probably difficult. I also want to see more one shots that are like Microscope. just really fully immersed in like a, a couple of moments because I think that's so interesting and like hard to play through. Like yeah, um, yeah, because it requires that that focus. But I think those things are like super interesting avenues for, mm. for games. So you mentioned um, players doing the narrative work and filling in the gaps between the scenes. And uh, we ha have noticed a trend where one shots are more likely to be GMless than longer games. And so Logan, throwing this one to you, do you think there's a particular reason for that? Just finding the unmute button. Yes, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think a lot of it um, is like Melody was saying, you have a limited amount of game and a limited amount of time. So you need to be able to get into the game really quickly. And I think for me, thinking about the GM role as often is, you know, like the, the knowledge keeper and they sort of pass out the story beats to the players bit by bit to, to carry them on this journey. Um, and that's left up, yeah, left up to them. But I think why it sort of turns GMless a lot of the time those games is to, I guess, maybe have more um, control or drive in making sure that those beats get met um, so that the, it's almost like the rules text or the designer themselves plays the role of GM um, by passing out those, uh, out those story beats. Uh, and also with GMless games, it can often be that you kind of know the shape of the story from the beginning. You're not being... Um, passed out the beats bit by bit you're not it's maybe less um less surprising i guess and you've got you've got the roadmap you've got the whole roadmap um out ahead of you and um so for that to be open for everyone to participate it lends itself to a gmless format um mm -hmm. so that everyone has like that role of making sure that the story moves along um is passed out around uh, amongst everyone um so everyone can get into the game and have that screen time between each other sort of equally um, mm. and more satisfyingly, I think, yeah. I think that's a really interesting comment that you made, Logan, about the fact that that one-shot games are almost more often GMless so that they can have more control over the story and its structure. Because usually we expect a game to have a GM uh, in order to be able to have more control over the plays and the kind of things that they can do. But in this case, as you said, the game is sort of the one stepping into that role. Um, and you also mentioned that one shots uh, need to be quick to start uh, because they do have so little time to get underway. Um, v, in your experience and in your work, what's the key to getting going quickly in a one shot game while still having enough to build on when you actually get into the meat of the game itself. Yeah, I think like building on a little bit of what Logan was uh, alluding to there, where like in a one shot, it's really important that people coming into the experience have like a roadmap and they're not surprised. I think a lot of that is like the group having set expectations of what that experience is going to be like so that everyone can contribute and push forward that, that get that ball rolling as quickly as possible altogether. And so I really think that that key to getting going quickly is that uh, setting expectations at the beginning. Um, it's like, I always think about it like a race, like a running race where it's like, you know, you've got the on your marks, get set, go. And like getting that moment correct, that sequence from uh, like when you're not playing the game to, hey, well, the race has started and we're playing the game and having the correct set of procedures to prime everyone correctly to get going is really like important. So you want to like spend a bit of time there as as a you know when you're designing a one-shot experience because i think if you set up well you can push off well and that kind of carries through um the rest of the race because you you really don't have that much time so getting um getting the setup correct will mean that you transition into like that ideal play experience where you're flowing and everyone already knows the rules um so a few things that i would kind of think about in that first section um I think about character creation is character creation part of your like before play or after play like have a really clear point of view on that and prepare people if you if character creation is in these steps that is part of play make sure that it's fun and make sure that people are thinking that they are playing at that point if it's not then maybe think about how to make that as quick 
uh, and easy as possible. So people uh, get momentum making the decisions and then they can transition into play quicker. Um, like something like For the Queen is really quick at that, where it really has those cards that you pull out to like do the explanation bit, but it feels like part of play because people are actively participating and drawing the cards and doing the same thing they would with the rest of the game. So it kind of like cheats that system and kind of gets people thinking they're playing earlier than they, they are maybe. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I do. The other thing I think about is getting people decisions early on uh, and getting that, that quick decisions, quick, easy decisions to get people like more confident and build their confidence going forward into the game. Mm, and those two things can be combined too, because of course, when you make decisions about character creation or about whatever choices you need to make in order to start the game, that those can be the first decisions that you can make and having those be accessible but evocative is obviously going to give you that kickstart to help uh, character creation become part of play. Uh, Sid, what's your view on getting started? God, what a great, what a great answer to, to like have to follow up, right? Like he just hit so many things there that are just, just beautiful. Um, I think I want to just put more verbs to what what V has said, really, because it's it's something that I've um, taken into my own play and my own design, uh, and I think can help maybe make this conversation a bit more actionable. Um, when V talks about like after after or during play character creation, um, <clears throat> there's this structure in um, uh, Dogs in the Vineyard, Vincent Baker's um, Dogs in the Vineyard, which um, characters have relationship dice. So because um, V, because you and I are cousins, I get plus D6 in contests where I'm against you or you're the thing at stake or whatever. Um, but it's really hard to sit down at the start of character creation and be like, okay, let's draw out my family tree, especially in a one shot. So what the game allows you to do is uh, to store those dice in a pool. And then when you meet someone, when you meet an NPC during play, you say, oh, by the way, that character is my brother-in-law, you know, my, my, you know, somewhere way back our bloodlines cross and we consider ourselves to be cousins even if like we're not physically sharing parent uh, sharing parents brothers and sisters um and what that does is, is it allows players to get into play without missing out on that joy of like asserting facts through character creation um i i love doing this in blades in the dark where uh, you just have your pool of points in a one shot, start playing. And then when your cutter comes up against something, you say, great, you're going to skirmish now. How good are you at skirmish? Are you one dot, two dot, three dot at skirmish? And then that allows them to spend those pools. And I find that to be a really actionable way of moving that character creation into the during play system. Um, for me, getting games to move as quickly towards um, functions of play which means I mentioned before my three things like agency, feedback, and delight, moving as quickly as possible towards where players make decisions with their agency that GMs then throw back to them as feedback is really critical. Uh, and, in, and in one shots, it's not about removing those decisions and moving to pre-generated characters. It's about shifting um, the burden of time that those decisions take up from before uh, agency and before feedback to during. Yeah, I, I like that. And, and do you think that changes the nature of the decisions and what kind of thing can constitute a decision? Or do you think that the decisions are kind of the same, but the way they're presented in the context of a one shot is maybe a little different? Uh, it, it absolutely changes the decision uh, because it changes the decision from uh, what do I want to see in play? Um, for example, my cutter says I have, I put three dots in skirmish that tells the GM that I want to fight people, um, to a response to play to saying, okay, I understand where this game is going and mm. I'm going to chase that and follow on with that. Mm. So the decisions that you're making are, are already part of telling the story, which is sort of a different way of looking at, um, some of the things that V said earlier. Um, Absolutely. Mel, what's your, what's your point of view in getting started in a one shot? Yeah, um, th those are some really, really good responses. I think I'm going to draw on a couple of those things. Um, I, yeah, I definitely think that like uh, having a kind of a, a, a unity of like the onboarding kind of steps and the actual game is, is really beneficial. Like kind of bringing in a one shot, you don't necessarily have time to have like two stages. 
we're going to create our world or our characters or whatever and learn the rules and then we're going to play the game because those are honestly kind of two separate often two separate games uh there i can't count the number of times i've done character creation for like a with friends for like a powered by the apocalypse game or something and at the end of it people often like people who are new to role-playing games have said wow that was so much fun i love creating characters that was like a whole game i feel like i've had a satisfied game experience already um and i think it can be like trying to then like do that and do another game uh, can do a disservice to both not necessarily um uh and i think um uh there are games that like kind of that process of making those decisions at the beginning about creating the world where uh, often are games where that is the game as well so a quiet year obviously a really famous example at the beginning of the game you're deciding what are the kind of the, the parts of our community what are our resources and then that's actually like what you continue to do through the whole game. And it's really, really effective uh, because you're not doing one thing, stopping doing another thing. Um, and uh, I think like another kind of element of it, like the, num the number one thing really for me is uh, like V was talking about with um, kind of equipping the players uh, and having good procedures and that kind of thing. Like having confident players is like the, is like the best thing you can do, uh, obviously. We're like talking about designing a game. There's only so much we can do, you know, like every game experience, every table is going to be really, really different. It's not our job to like, you know, um, to do that. But like having players who feel like they have the information that they need, that they're confident to make decisions, even if they're, even if they actually don't have the information they think they need, like even if they're wrong or like they're going to regret some of those decisions or whatever, if they think that, that like if they feel like they're happy to jump right in um, and just make a decision, even arbitrary ones, uh, that's going to like just get things moving really, really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my, in my own design, I guess I really like to uh, have people choose a, just some really basic thing at the beginning and then actually the character creation or world creation or whatever is done actually through the game. Uh, maybe it looks like you're creating character at the beginning. One of my games, Interloper, which is kind of inspired by Annihilation, Stalker, Roadside Picnic, um, that kind of thing about going onto an expedition into the, the strange zone. Uh, you choose kind of like who your character is in the context of this group of people going into the zone, but then the actual context for the game is you've gone into the zone and come back and now you're doing a debriefing. Uh, so the, the events have kind of already happened, but we're finding out who your characters are as we play the game. And you don't, you know, I would discourage people from thinking too much about it before starting to play. Um, uh, also, third thing, like minimal mechanics. I don't want to learn like the, <laughs> what the five different attributes and like skills and things mean in a one shot. Uh, I can't learn, learn that very well in like three sessions. You know, it takes me like a whole season to, to internalize that stuff. I don't want to be choosing like optimal kind of strategic things for a one shot. That's just my preference, I suppose. But like, just give me a character. Uh, let me choose between the five different characters or whatever. Um, I think pre-gen characters are super underrated uh, and games with little to no mechanics also super underrated. Yeah. Great. Well, you just answered one of the questions from chat, which is one of the benefits of pre-gen characters. And I'm glad you did, because there are some great questions coming through. But um, <laughs> we, we, we don't have much like a one shot. We must continue onwards for uh, time. So hopefully we can come back for them later. Uh, and speaking of continuing onwards and keeping up momentum, that's one thing that one shots need to do. So not only do you need to get a good start, but once you get going, players need to know what it is that they need to do next, how to keep continuing the story, how to keep continuing with play of the game. And that that can be its own design challenge in itself. Uh, Logan, how, how do you think we can help players achieve that in our design? Yeah, I, I'm reminded of what Melody said about um, player confidence being really important. And I think a lot of that comes back to the design of the game and giving players enough tools that they, it feels really clear how they move the story forward. Um, and I, I remember, you know, in learning D and D, I had looked at the book and had no idea how to play, right? And then I watched an actual play. I'm like, oh, okay, this is how it works. So there are many other systems out there that have really strong structure. Um, a favorite of mine is the Firebrands framework by Vincent and McGay Baker, um, where there's yeah very 
clear structure and there's turn taking as well um much like for the queen there's turn taking i feel like turn taking um which sounds may sound like a really boring thing is actually really great for structure and um for you know sharing the spotlight and um, allowing there to be enough um story in the room for everyone to build on Uh, so i think turn taking and, and and clear structure are really important and it doesn't have to be um, that's, you know, it's that, that continuum of, of how much structure feels restricting versus how much structure do we actually need to know where to go? Um, how, yeah, how clear is the, is the path on the roadmap? So people are like, oh, this is where we're going. And it's not just an open green field. And we're like, uh, uh, how do I, so that's a design, um, thing as well. And, and, uh, a challenge for anyone designing a one-shot game or running, running a one-shot in any sort of system. Um, but I think turn-taking is really key, which ties into the GMless uh, piece as well. It take, again, takes away that need for a, a game master or a facilitator, um, and structure in as much as, um, it can be as, as minute as like, how does a turn work in, in a turn-taking game? Or, you know, how do we move through a scene? Um, or broadly, like, how does this um, this whole session go? So there are games mm. with phases of play, um, with, you know, you have a like beginning, middle, and end, and that's really clearly delineated. Um, but, yeah, you know, structure can, can be in different size chunks as well. But having, I think, any sort of structure is, is really key in getting players into the experience and confident in moving all the way through to the end. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's the saying that constraints create creativity. And I think structure is one of the cases that we see that being the most true where that structure isn't a restriction, but rather a bouncing off point that actually can create a meaningful story. A V. Uh, so speaking of turn taking and structure, that's a sort of a feature of pretty much all the one shot games that you've designed. Um, do you want to talk a bit more about uh, getting people through the game and what tools make people feel empowered to tell the story throughout the game? Yeah, I think I think uh, what Logan was saying about chunks is really important because like when you are trying to put together that structure for your one shot and you're thinking as a game designer, it's like there's a few different axes that you can choose to chunk up. Like you can ch- chunk roles um, up like in those belonging apps, like belonging games where, okay, parts of the GM Ming or facilitating gets split like this between people, you can chunk up like, um, so like the, those are the game rules, time with turn taking, you can chunk up rules so that um, you start with easy, simple interactions and then build out from there. I'm thinking like, uh, like, I don't know, my game village really kind of does that. But like, um, if you played any of those board games that use card building games where you start with like a few simple cards and then it, it spirals out of control, like you can do that with rules so that people are learning slowly. Um, and kind of gaining mastery over the system without it whole kind of hitting them all at once and just chunking it up. Uh, so I think that's a lot of what you're thinking about is how to plot the different things. So when people are going through your one-shot experience, they're never overwhelmed, but they are like on this curve of like gaining intensity. And then they hit a point where they they're, can ride it out and then eventually it ends because it's a one-shot. <laughs> Hmm, that's right. And one of the questions that people ask in the chat is what can games that aren't one shots learn from one shots? And I think that that, as Logan said, that sense of like structure that keeps the momentum and then that idea of learning the rules as you go so people can jump in accessibility might be a big thing uh, for other games to pick up on because we all love getting into play uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, so once you've once you played your one shot, uh, once once you have built all this story, uh, one of the hardest things about a one shot can be bringing it to an end, especially when you have the clock ticking, you know, you only have a few, you only have a limited time left to play, you don't have hours and hours to spend wrapping on this game, um, wrapping up this game. So the question that I have now is how do you end a one shot in a way that is satisfying? And what is it that makes it feel like a whole story has been told? I'm going to throw this one to Melody first, and I do want to integrate here a question that has come through from the chat, which is, uh, and, and sort of builds on this question of endings, which are what are the benefits or costs of having a known or solved destination in a one-shot game, be that through flash forward techniques or through explicit structure? So you already know at the start of the game where you're going to go. Yeah, so that... <laughs> Thank you for integrating that because that is one of my favorite like techniques as a player and as a like GM or designer or, or whatever. Um, like, I think it is 
offers so many interesting possibilities to start like to start at kind of the end of the story or partway through the story or um and like kind of ground everything in that and it gives we were talking about kind of player confidence and people feeling equipped uh to like to play the game and jump in and like having a destination to get to is um is one i i find is a great way great way to do that uh so for context uh, my game on mighty wheels is about the russian revolution uh and it starts the current in the current versions of the game it starts with a bunch of you are in the win winter palace it's like burning down around you or smoking there's gunfire things like that you're this family of people one of you has a gun there's someone on the floor uh with the gun pointed at them who has the gun who's the person on the floor and we figure out that basic thing we look at that for a couple of minutes and then we jump back to a couple of days prior and we find out who who how we got there uh it i th i think it like offers a nice balance of like giving something to work towards um but also uh it doesn't really tell us that much about like what has happened before that point um it tells us where we're going but it doesn't really lock in um specific things about what you know the world the people that kind of thing and i think having that like that wiggle room and freedom is really nice um uh similar like similarly i really like games that we know how they're going to end uh quiet year 10 candles 10 candles one of my favorite games just like i love knowing it's going to have a sad a sad ending um uh and yet every time i still play it as though i might avoid that um uh which i think is just yeah uh it's just a wonderful experience but yeah so i think that um honestly I think this is a question for games in general, one shots campaign games that has not like I don't think there is an answer. I think everyone's still trying to figure this out. Ending a session of any game is so hard. <laughs> like in a satisfy you know, it was satisfying way. And that's especially hard in GMless games. I find they can often kind of like drag off into people being like, ah, oh, so we finished here, which can be fine. But I personally I really like to have like a note that we end on, like a a ritual. Um I think having that kind of like that closing ritual, whether it's reading something, reviewing something, revisiting a scene, uh, narrating something, is just like a really nice, it feels like a really nice way to wrap things up. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, that said, I don't think the story needs to end. I think I love games that end unresolved. Interloper, like at the end of that game, we don't know what the, like what anything means anymore, but like the, the game ends. And it leaves us wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, and there's like a ritual for the game ending. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really great distinction that that a game itself can have a satisfying end because we feel like uh, it's concluded, but the story itself may still have question marks that go long into the future. Um, and there's always the question mark of if you're playing a game with characters, what happens to these characters next? Yeah. Um, but speaking of games that have an ending that uh, you know from the moment you start playing the game, Sid, Decaying Orbit is definitely built around this structure. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd love to get your thoughts on endings and how to build a powerful ending for a one-shot. Definitely is. So for those of you who haven't seen um, Decaying Orbit, kickstarting now, uh, Little Box Journeys, um, Decaying Orbit begins by saying, uh, we're on board this space station. This space station will end. The game ends when this space station collapses into the sun. When you know gravity overcomes us, we collapse into the sun. Uh, and then the minute that happens, like you stop playing. That's it. And that's because the question that Decaying Orbit is asking, and the the um, tension and the conflict that the, that the game is creating, is not actually about answers and resolution. It's about creating questions. So it's a game that you're meant to walk away from it being like, oh, I don't know what the real truth was here. Maybe I have a different understanding than other people. And you're meant to kind of ruminate on it. And and that's that's because the the act of building questions is the dramatic conceit of that game, not the act of answering them. Um, the, the, the shadow uh, to that game would be McGay Baker's Siren, which is about answering questions. And you start that game by writing down three questions for your character and as soon as all those questions are answered that's it you stop playing and and even if you know you are in the caught in a net by an evil scientist who is ready to dissect your brain that's it like play stops because you've answered the questions which is what we set out to do and so i think there's um 
there's something really beautiful to that play, like your play experience and reward structure are aimed towards that goal. And then the minute you achieve that goal, you have to stop. There's a there's a thing in uh, in dog training called an end of session signal. And the reason that happens is um, if you have decided to stop rewarding a dog for doing its behavior because you're no longer training it and it keeps doing it, it gets like frustrated and it gets confused as to like why why is this thing I was doing and getting rewarded no longer being rewarded? And it's it's the same with one shots. If your game is about um if you if you if you make a game that is about killing dragons and when you kill the last dragon you're like great let's play for another 10 minutes players don't know what to do because they're not going to get rewarded for the same behavior they used to do and the game's not going to go in the same direction that it was and they're going to get confused and they're going to get frustrated and so for whoever out there is making um dragon slay simulator 1000 uh when when thou hast slain the last dragon, you have drawn the last card, or or that game is over, and it's the the same with decaying orbit. Like when you fall into that sun, you have asked enough questions. You don't get to answer them because that's not the game we're playing. You want to answer questions? Go play Siren. Go play a different game. <laughs> that's a very interesting perspective. That the game itself asks a question and that the way to end a one shot game satisfyingly is by answering that question um and that's an interesting way of looking at it logan what do you think about endings and how one shot games might come to an end yeah that the idea of um a question and an answer i think and and final scenes as well are really important so i think when i'm thinking of um one shot games there it has a, a core pitch or an idea um, thinking of uh, Alexander Sword's Forest Paths method of narrative design. <laughs> Sid makes a note. Um, yeah, so the, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> there it is, Exhibit A. Um, so in, in this um, design uh, method, there's this idea of a high concept formula, which is like the big pitch, the big, the big idea behind your game. Uh, and I'm going to use stealing the throne as, as an example, because it's an awesome one shot game that I've played a lot of times. And the, the high concept form, formula is you play as thieves, you have to avoid guards and security measures to steal a 1000 year old mech. That's the pitch. And then in order to get your, um, you know, the question about what is this game about, you turn that form that that pitch into a question. So can you, the thief, avoid guards and security to steal a 1000 year old mech? Question mark. And the way to, for me to, to end that one shot satisfyingly is to answer that question. Maybe it's yes, maybe it's no, um, but that, that question needs an answer. Uh, and the story mm -hmm. might not end like with, with stealing the throne. Yeah, this, the game ends when you've stolen the mech, but there is the unsolved questions of, okay, now you've got this massive, powerful thing. What are you going to do with it? And that's, that's left unanswered. That's, you know, what do your characters do next? That is purposely kind of left unanswered. But the, the core conceit, the core question of the game is. And I think what's really important for me when I'm playing a one shot and how I would like it to end is to have a final scene that kind of explicitly answers that question. Um, so with Stealing the Throne, um, the, the answer to the question, do you steal the mech, yes or no, is culminated in a final scene, the getaway scene, where you play, play out that getaway and what it looks like and the final you know the big we break through the roof and just smash the building and fly off mm. into the sun etc and i find when there's a one scene dedicated to answering and ending that question um that's what feels really satisfying for me um and i think that is yeah regardless of whether i know the outcome at the end or, or not uh, whether that's already set out for me um i think having that that dedicated scene which will look different each time i play because i'll be playing with different people and we'll put our, our fingerprints on it in a different way um, that's still what makes it really satisfying like yes i've done i've done the thing and he's like i can point to it right or i haven't done the thing and i can point to why it didn't happen um yeah final scenes are really powerful in my opinion Absolutely, they definitely are. And I feel like I do need to go back to Interloper here and, and, and Mel, because I really want to get your opinion on this, because Interloper is a game where you, you are in a debriefing 
and you start the debriefing and the game, although I know it's in development, so please excuse me if I'm wrong about this, ends when you finish the debriefing. But often you're going to end the game with more questions than you started with. And that question of what happens, which the game mm. sets you up at the beginning to try and interrogate, is deliberately one that's left unanswered at the end of the game. Um, so I would like to hear about your design thoughts about that and how that maybe interacts with that uh, idea that you should ask and answer a question in the center of a one shot. Yeah, that's wow. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I think it is a. I really like it, uh, like as a player in in other games and that kind of thing as well. Like not answering the question, leaving the question unresolved, maybe a matter of personal preference. But I think it is definitely a. It's a like complex thing and like a complicated thing, as in it feels complicated for people participating in that and having those questions unanswered, and like. It leaves you, it can leave you like kind of unsettled. Um, uh, it leaves a certain like tension in the air. Uh, I kind of got the idea from some of my favorite books, uh, like the Southern Reaches trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer, where just it's like three books, each of them's pretty short and sharp. At the end of them, I still like years later, I like wake up at night and I'm like, wait, what's, what does that mean? <laughs> and like, and it's really sometimes really uncomfortable. There's some really unsettling bits in it. Um, and not having answers is very uncomfortable, but like, I'm still thinking about it years later. And I still like talk about it all the time. And I find that at the end of a game session, if the question is unanswered or unanswerable, or if we don't know, like it leaves it ambiguous, I find that we, as the group immediately start talking about it and like talking about like our, our ideas and like what we thought about and like what informed our decisions, that kind of thing. It provides us really, because there is that maybe that discomfort, um, it provides us that like jumping off point to just like because the game is over but the game in a sense is not over uh we're still feeling feeling those feelings um mm. uh yeah so i it's definitely not what doesn't work for every game uh <laughs> probably not everyone's jam i've talked to players who aren't really fans uh but it's i find it a really satisfying kind of like experience not knowing the answer frustrating yeah. but satisfying well, I mean, that's one of the things about Interloper, which is that the fact that you don't find a question at the end reinforces the theme of the game itself. Whereas yeah, it's that's, of course, that something that's not true about, about every game. Um, yeah. And, you know, Decaying Orbit is somewhat like that too, in that you, you come to mm. an answer. You answer the question of what is the meaning of the thing that we have experienced, but you don't necessarily answer the question of exactly what happened to the ship. It depends on the game, whether you do or you don't. Yeah. Um, but I do want to throw to, to V here, um, uh, just having a look at time to answer that question of endings, because uh, I, I do know that um, Village Song, for example, ends in a really different way in that it asks you to read out a poem. Uh, and that poem sort of sheds a light on the experience that you've just um, undergone. So what's your view on endings, V? Yeah, so in Village Song, you're a village leader and you're making decisions all throughout the games about like, do what do I do with the village? Do I do this or do I do that? And every decision you make, you're getting like a little snippet, a stanza of a poem, and it adds to your little like story and poem of your village. And at the end of the game, everyone kind of reads it. How we have like this poetry reading, everyone reads what history remembers of their village uh, based on the decisions that you've made in that game. Um, and that's kind of just like an end cap of like how that story ends um i guess i guess my thinking hearing what everyone has been speaking about is like as a game designer you want to break out your you, you want to know what kind of endings you have so like in fiction writing there's like lots of different kinds of endings that you can go towards like there's resolved endings there's unresolved endings there's like that epilogues section where it, you kind of like fast forward there's unexpected twist endings there's open to interpretation ambiguous endings there's those endings that come full so there's a lot of different kinds of endings basically and you want to know what ending you are your game is heading towards and then you can build out um that use different tools to kind of build out a satisfying ending there because hearing what everyone is talking about like depending on kind of what kind of ending it is like what feels satisfying is different like so identify what kind of ending your game is doing and then once you kind of have that and it can be collection it could be more that could end in more than one of those ways but um i think it's really in one shot maybe it's a good idea for setting expectations to like really go for one of those um types of endings and then build stuff that 
will uh, make that uh, that particular ending really special. So like two different examples, like if with something like, uh, you know, the, the epilogue style ending, uh, you can go like the way of uh, fiasco where you randomly are on all on a table and then you, okay, because we don't really care about these characters, they're meant to just uh, like implode. You take away that character agency and that feels fine for that game because you, you're not, you know, those characters aren't precious to you. But in a different game where those characters are precious to you, that epilogue might need more player agency to make it feel satisfying rather than taking that player agency away. So maybe the players can say how their character epilogues out. Um, so yeah, just think about what kind of endings you have. And then there's a million different ways that you can, um, you, you, you little tricks to, that you can use. You can leave the players with something like those artifact type games. You can let drop the Jenga tower, you can burn the character sheets, a million different things. But if you know what you're heading towards, then you can kind of build a satisfying ending that is particular to your game. I think a lot of the good examples that we've talked about today feel like they're like so married up. And that's like the strength of the game designer having kind of thought intentionally about that and weaving it together in that way. But when you are designing, you're kind of like, you got, you got to pull it apart first and know what all the different bits uh, that you're working with is. I think I kind of went on a tangent there. I'm not sure if I answered it. But oh, no, super you definitely, valuable tangent. You definitely okay, that's, answered that's usually it. How I, that's usually Amazing. how I think about it. What I understood from that is that the ending itself is a game design tool, that the ending doesn't have to fit any particular criteria or be any way other than be what is best to reinforce the thesis and to make your game itself yeah. tell the message that it's wanting to have. And I, one of the things that came out from what you said, particularly from your example fiasco, is the way that the ending of the game causes us to reinterpret what has happened in the game previously, especially with one-shot games, um, and, and cast a different light on the events that we have already seen in the past. So I think that's a really interesting point that you've added there as well. Well, we do have exactly four minutes left. And what I think we can do is answer exactly one question in that four minutes. And I'm going to get everyone to, to chip in for this one because the question is a favorite one-shot game you've ever played or a favorite. I'm not going to get you to, to uh, have to come up with your all-time number one in, in, in 30 seconds or less. Um, but a favorite one-shot game you've, you've played, some a, a one-shot game that you've really enjoyed, uh, have a think. Uh, no particular order here when, when you know what one shot game you'd like to put forward into the ether? Uh, shout out. Yeah, I saw this question come up in the chat and I've been thinking about it the whole time. Uh, I have three ones. So I have Village Song, up your award winning game by V. Hendrew, Village Song. Um, I also really enjoy Sealing the Throne, which I talked about today by Nick Bate. And um, a really cute duet game that I quite enjoy is A Single Pair by Tabletop Hot Dish. Those are my three. Thank you, Logan. Uh, I I love um, so I'll hit you from some different tones. Um, talking about games with novelty that are doing things that are that are wonderful for one shots. Uh, Bluebeard's Bride, um, Strix, and I can't remember all of the authors on that. I'm so so sorry. Um, nor can I remember who published it, but a phenomenal game uh, with a really deep and like um, unsettling tone. Uh, our, our Monday Supernatural Life. Our Monday in Supernatural, our, Superna our Monday in Supernatural Life, um, which is a phenomenal game about like um, pastoral. It's the only game that's ever captured me in Slice of Life, uh, and it's just a joy, um, start to finish. Uh, and my last one is the game that I played fifty odd times now, which is uh, Decaying Orbit, kickstarting now, Little Box Journeys. Um, like you know, designed it because I love it. Uh, it is easily my favorite game to pick up and play. Yeah, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna design a game, you better love it because you're gonna have to play it at least fifty times. What do we say, Mel? What what, do you, what games do you love? Uh, look, I gotta come back to Ten Candles because like I just like no, probably no game has stuck with me that much. The first time I played it, I was like, oh yeah, like I've heard this game is like a sad horror game. I love sad things. I love horror things. Then afterwards, as I'm like sobbing, like full on sobbing into someone's shoulder, probably Luke Jordan's, who I think is in the chat. Uh, someone's like, Mel, you said you love sad games. I'm like, I do. It was incredible. Um, also, uh, a game I've played and I really, really want to play again because it was just so impactful was Starcrossed um, by Alex Roberts. Yeah, those ones. V, you have 30 seconds to give your that. answer. Go. Go. Um, my actual, like, uh, Starcross, great game. But uh, my my favorite one-shot session that I've had was, uh, Mel, you were in this. We played it in Phenomena 
phen phenomenon, which is a Canberra-based uh, convention here in Australia. And it was a game, I think it was called Five Queens. I think it only ran in that one thing, but it was like part LARP, part moody atmospheric. We got the lights turned off. We had uh, like pre-generated characters. It had a lot of cool things in it. Um, you can't find it, so I'm sorry. Yeah, it'd be great work it. on recommending a game yeah, that no one published. else here can ever play. It's I think it's really, really, really a delight. Good. This panel was a delight, yep. and now this panel is over. <laughs> thanks, y'all. Thanks for listening to this panel. Bye. <laughs>